Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Lorene, uh, for being here. Um, we've been having conversations here. about uh, trying to have this conversation for a long time, and we are grateful for you being here uh, today. Uh, and we want to thank everybody who's been here all day, by the way, and who's hanging in. Uh, and we're having uh, some really interesting conversations. Some really interesting conversations. So thank and you for that. We're making news too. We we are making news. You may you may make some news as well for us. Yeah. Here's so let's see if your questions are good. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's where I wanted to start the conversation. Um, I said uh, at the very beginning of the day when we were introducing uh, who was going to be speaking that I think of you um, as really one of the the most um, under the radar, but quickly emerging influencers in the world right now. Um, you've just bought a piece, uh, or you just bought the Atlantic, you've bought some sports teams. Uh, you're involved in education and immigration and climate change in a very, very big way. And I wanted to, to start the conversation a, a little bit uh, to try to understand where this all comes from and what this is all about. I should say we have a lot of people from the, the finance industry. You started your career uh, and spent some time at Goldman Sachs. I did, I did. Early on, yeah. fixed income trader? Yes, well, I, I was on the fixed income trading floor. I was um, an analyst and, and I worked on the um, fixed income trading portfolios. Uh, we did computerized and optimized portfolios for the traders for different desks. Um, so we were support staff to people like uh, Paul Jacobson and, and Steve Mnuchin, as it turned out. And John Corzine was everybody's boss on the floor. So here you are now. And here I am now. From analyst. So I, I do understand your characterization that it seems that, um, that I've been under the radar and now all of a sudden there's a, there's a lot of news with my name in it. From my point of view, I've just been doing the work for 20 years uh, and and a lot of the issues that we've been working on are issues of our day, and, and they're getting much more prominent, and um, the work that we've been doing is starting to accumulate. But it, it, you know, being on the inside, it seems like I just keep doing the same thing I've been doing. So tell us, though, about a couple of the things that have been very public and have been in the headlines. Uh, you did acquire The Atlantic, for example. Yes, well, well it, yes, we're in partnership with David Bradley for the next several years, and, and I hope longer, but that's, that's accurate. But you're, all, but you're also uh, supporting all sorts of other media organizations, um, journalistic uh, uh, organizations. You've uh, spent some money in Hollywood. What, what, it, what it, from, the, from just the, the, the media piece of it, uh -huh. what is that about? Um, well, that supports all of our work. So, th so the core of our work is in education, generally in, in K-12, public education in America, a little bit outside of our borders as well, um, immigration reform, and, and a healthy environment for, for all people, moving off of fossil fuels into renewables and having healthy and clean air, water, soil for people's betterment. Um, so the media portfolio came through because we, we built out a Marcom's muscle because when you're we're in the social change sector and when you're in that sector you have to also look at behavior and identity and the cultural narrative and so that's that's why we started doing our own comm stuff and then we started looking at media and we realized that if you're not part of the cultural conversation you could work your entire life trying to in a Sisyphean way uh, move things forward and be crushed if, if you don't uh, if you don't connect with people at the heart and mind level. So is the idea to use a number of these different media assets to echo or amplify the message of what you're doing? Are they or are they acting independently or? Um, listen, we also believe in in that's a good question. We believe obviously. I got in the one. Importance of, I got one. You did. Yeah, the importance of of, of free and unfettered press and media and, and its role in our democracy. And we, we know the business model is, um, is weakened and we also feel that that kind of shoring up and that kind of belief um, and the kind of patient capital that we can bring to media companies is essential for the health and well-being of our democracy. So it's, it's also as Americans we, we think it's really important. Um, 
we certainly don't have a long hand into the editorial content of any of the media properties that we invest in, either either in a for-profit way or right. a non. So you're not encouraging way. them necessarily to 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 make climate change an issue one way or the other. No, but. Um, Luckily, we all believe in science, and so they cover it in the way that they cover it, um, which is which right. is based on on science and. and let me let me ask you about a, a meeting a meeting you had w with someone who I imagine you may think doesn't um, necessarily believe in science. You met with uh, President Trump. I did uh, earlier this year to talk to him about a number uh, of, of issues. Tell us about that meeting. It it was right in the beginning of the year, and. Um, I met with him uh, to talk about preserving DACA status for Dreamers, um, and and we talked a lot about the Dreamers. We talked a little bit about education. Um, we were also right on our way to go to Haiti, and so we had some work there that we shared with him. I talked to him about the XQ Super School Initiative that we were doing, and he was he was interested in that. But most of it was around talking about Dreamers, and. Uh, and he reassured me and everyone in the room that he had a big heart for Dreamers. He said the same thing publicly that he said to us privately, that he believes that Dreamers were brought here through no fault of their own, that we should, we should protect them, that they, that they add a lot to, he didn't use these words, the fabric of our society, but he did say something like, um, I have a very, very big heart, a bigger heart than most people know, and so I'll... I'll <laughs> Those were his words. Um, so um, I, I took some, I, you know, I took some modicum amounts of comfort in that. Uh, he's still in his rescinding of of the executive action that provided protected status to Dreamers. Even then, he's he he did challenge, as you know, challenge Congress to get the Dream Act passed. Were you surprised when that happened, given the conversation you had had with him? Um, there were, I, I don't know if you know, uh, in September there were, there, the time was ticking because there were attorneys general who were pressing, um, who, who were bringing forward a challenge to DACA as unconstitutional. Um, so he rescinded DACA a, a few days before that was to happen. But you, you started airing political ads in the wake of, of, of Trump's DACA decision, right? Well, it's a political issue, yeah. And, and we believe strongly that uh, Congress needs to pass <clears throat> the DREAM Act or something akin to it. There are a number of, of bills that, that are right in Congress now that have bipartisan support. So yes, what we want to do is put some pressure on people who have to take this vote so that finally, after 16 years of, of using DREAMers as uh, political tennis balls or ping pong balls, we can actually do what's right for them and what's right for the families and what's right for the country. Um, interestingly, um, but I could also tell you, not only are we, are we using advertising and marketing, but we're also using art to, and, and to bring uh, forth the, the issue in different ways. So we have, we've partnered with the artist JR, if you know him. Yep. Um, we worked with him to construct that image of the baby on the border fence that a lot of people ended up seeing. We have photo booth trucks that are crisscrossing the United States right now, two, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, that are going to different districts, mainly Republican districts, right. and, and garnering local press, and, and local dreamers and DACA recipients are coming out, and people from all over the political spectrum are coming out and showing their support. Right. What is, um, dare I ask, the politics of it, I thought uh, that you might be a Democrat, but then I recently saw that you're an independent. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. It's correct. How do you, where, where do you fall on the political spectrum these days? Um, and how much does that influence? Yeah, well, I've, I've been a registered independent for a long time. Uh, I, I find that like most of America, I fall more in the center than I do either the right or the left. Um, my political giving, personal political giving, goes mainly to Democratic elected officials for the, for the reason, main reason that unless Republican um, elected trust women to make 
the right to say, or their own decisions um, about their bodies, I wouldn't give them any political funding. Um, there are some closely held. Uh, you can clap. <laughs> um, there, there's some some straight up Republican precepts that I, that I relate to around um, certain, certainly around uh, fiscal adherence um, and. We used to have common ground with Republicans around, uh, I, this, is, this is sort of a, a fiery word right now, but around um, appropriate choice for parents um, as to finding an excellent education for their child and, and having choice uh, in the school system. And so we used, to, we used to find common cause with Republicans around education reform, less so now, um, but we in, in Years past, we did. Um, otherwise, I'd say, for me personally, um, anyone who has very well-founded, um, empirically-based, science-based uh, policies that address the issues of our day are the, are the people that I find most aligned with. And so those tend to be Democrats. Um, you mentioned the fiscal fiscal side. Um, I'm just curious because we've had a lot of conversations on the stage about the, the current tax plan. Do you have a view? Um, not really. I, I don't. I mean, I've, I've, I saw that Howard Schultz called it fool's gold, which I think is a it, it, that's that's a provocative way to frame it. Um, I don't necessarily have a, a right. position. I think that uh, people go on fall on either side of the issue around whether corporate tax rate cuts will actually um, spur business. I do think we have to have a, a policy environment that makes it easy to start businesses, since small businesses are, are the engines for economic growth. And we have to have policies that address uh, income inequality that, um, that is corrosive in our society. You know, the other conversation we've had a little bit today is this idea of an independent party, a third party. Do you see a day where that is a re could be a reality, and is that something you'd ever be prepared to fund? Um, okay, so those are two different questions. <laughs> I, I think if you, if, if you had people, yes, first of all, I think there's a huge appetite for a third party um, and, and an opportunity, and I think it could even happen in 2020. I think what we're seeing um, are, are you know, great, great deal of polarization due to either gerrymandering or, or the siloing of news and information that people are getting. And so, and the, the more radical and reactionary the idea, the more clickbait it is, and it's, it's taking purchase in, uh, I think, our, our, our body politic. And so we, I feel like the politicians these days are, are really leaving open enormous amounts of real estate in centrist politics and common sense politics. And if, if we had leaders who were stepping up and leading that center, not only would I support them with funding, I would support them um, in a thoughtful way as much as I can, you know, pushing out really good messages through our networks and through some of the organizations we work with. Any names? Do you have any names? Well, uh, you know, uh, your name, your by the way, has been, business. your name has been speculated about as well. Well, that's news. <laughs> um, Certainly not by me. Uh, let, let me ask you. Let me ask you about education, because uh, that has been a, sort of the central hallmark of, of Emerson very early on. Uh, what are you doing in the high school space so that people really just understand it, and then we can sort of dig into it? Um, so we're doing. We do a lot in the high school space. Uh, Twenty years ago, I started a nonprofit organization called College Track that's still working today with. 4,000 students, and, and we, we make a promise to students in the beginning of high school that we will be with them and support them in all means necessary through high school um, and through college completion. Uh, and we now have over 500 students that we have supported who have graduated from college. We have more than 10% of them in graduate school. They're all employed. Um, the vast majority, over 90% of them, are first in their families to complete college. And so my, my involvement and my activism in education came, other than through my own children, came um, 
through those children who I met and, their, and through their families um, who I to this day continue to interact with. And so I got an amazing um, bird's eye view and, and close up view of, of how inequities play out in our education system and how that promise of a public education being a great equalizer in America is actually not a promise that is fulfilled across the United States. Um, if anybody tells you that income doesn't determine the public education that you receive, do not believe them because it does. And it's something that we all should be very, very concerned about and active around. You, meant, you mentioned XQ earlier. Just tell the audience what that is. Yeah, okay, so I, I, was, getting, I was getting to some of the work that we do in education. So um, the experience through college track informed and continues to inform all the work that we do in public education. Um, we decided several years ago when Ruslan Ali left the Obama administration, she ran the Office of Civil Rights, she came and joined the Emerson Collective. And uh, after, after some time working together, we realized that we could continue to work around the edges of the system or we could take all the learnings that we had had for so long and try to work within the system and transform the system. and, and build tools and be a thought leader and open source system redesign and, and infusing some new thinking into, into what is a real calcified and intractable system. Uh, and so we founded the XQ Institute, we incubated it in Emerson and we spun it out. It's a private operating foundation. And through that we issued a national challenge to redesign high school in America. Uh, and we had 10,000 people sign up and com communities assembled and we gave people strong guidelines to follow their designs and they competed for to be an XQ super school. Um, we had over 700 full applications and this was seven months of, of deep work that, that teams had to do in communities with the workforce, understanding who are the employers in their regions, mapping the learnings onto the workforce, breaking away from the Carnegie unit and having mastery and, and content learning at the center of all learning, experiential and absolutely relevant learning, driving the learnings. And then all, you know, with a nod to mastery of fundamental literacies and numeracies, but also understanding what are the core expertise and skills and capacities that students need coming out of high school. So in the end, we funded, um, we had 10 winners, and then we funded another eight after that. After, after the competition was over, we had another 160 communities move forward to build their high schools. So uh, we're just continuing to deepen that work and open source all the tools that are developed as a result. What do you think, and I'm sure you've read some of the articles of, uh, of critics, if you will, who say that high school doesn't need fixing, that high school is the least of the education problems in this country. I believe there was an article that even referenced that in the New York Times. Hmm. Um, I'd like to talk to the writer. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can I'll make an introduction. Actually, um, because uh, I could just give you a couple of statistics. We have, uh, at most, 50% of the students who graduate from American high schools are prepared for college or career. Um, we, have, we have only half of the high schools in America teaching calculus. We have only two thirds teach either physics or chemistry. These of course map on to income levels, but we're not even close to where we need to be. Um, in, in the state of California where I live, we don't have one single county that has a majority of Latino students who are proficient in either math or English at the grades four, eight, or 12. So we're not even close to where we need to be, not only as a state, but as a nation. And um, if anybody's satisfied with being number 31 in math in OECD countries on PISA exams and 27 in English, then, then they should sit around feeling satisfied. But I, for one, am not happy with that. I'm curious, how do you think about these issues, meaning um, you've now invested and, 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 and donated your, your, your uh, funds uh, and time and energy in, into these uh, sort of three, three and very related now buckets, but do you, have a, do you have a mentor 
in, in all of this? Is there anybody you talk to uh, about this? I mean, you're sort of in a very sort of special and unique position. There's not a lot of people um, that can play at this level. Um, you know, I, I do. I talk to a number of people who who just uh, inspire me endlessly, and I, I'd say that there there are people both young and old in Silicon Valley who think about things very differently, who I get to see uh, regularly, who I'm always checking in with to find out what they're thinking about. Um, they're, they're generally big, audacious thinkers, and I like to fold in audacity into, into our work to make sure we're thinking big enough and um, we're stretching ourselves enough. And I think um, as long as as long as you can have these thoughts and then architect a pathway uh, to get there, then you'll find that every day is an exciting day to live. Speak a little bit about the culture of the valley. Uh, Steve was a great enthusiast for the culture of big thinking. And, and you have now very big thoughts about where this is all going. Um, but there's also questions in this country about the views in the valley and how they relate uh, to elsewhere. Do you think about that? There's this idea that... I mean, well, well I, can, I, I can certainly address the culture of the valley, which is changing. I mean, culture is a dynamic thing, and it changes based on and who's coming in. And so um, there's some, some clear inequities, gender inequities, racial inequities, income inequities, that people are talking about and writing about that I think is really good. We should be focused on those things, and we should turn a, a good spotlight on that. Um, but there's also this culture of, of unfetteredness that's hard to understand um, unless, unless you're there for a little while, and you start to, you start to feel that people are unencumbered by, by history and tradition in, in a really healthy way. Um, I didn't grow up in California, as you know. I came from, from New York uh, to Stanford for grad school. And so I feel like I can appreciate how, how wonderful and freeing it is to be in a place where, where it, you're, you're pretty darn close to being a bit of a meritocracy, where, where your ideas and, and your sense of possibility and your hard work and your ability to assemble teams and drive towards a common goal um, are really at, at the apex. So I think it's important for all of us to, to understand what's great about Silicon Valley and to understand what's not great about Silicon Valley and challenge it, but to also preserve what's really great about it and maybe spread it elsewhere across the right. country because it's a, it is a very exciting place to live. What do you think of the criticism? I mean, we've had conversations about whether Silicon Valley should be regulated uh, more than it is. Do you, do, you, do you think about that? You mean, you mean tech companies? Big tech companies, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of talk about that. Obviously, your last talker from Facebook. I think uh, right now, right now, people are, are, I think, being very understandably cautious about opening up what, what's really parts of what's really working in our economy and in our society to regulation, which typically is a crude instrument. Um, and we should, we should think about self-regulation versus government regulation. I think that uh, the tech companies do this. I think they're, they're trying to figure out how to do what they do much better and, and to avoid some of the, the uh, I, very negative, very difficult um, issues that have started to crop up. Right. Um, I want to open up to questions in, in, in just a moment. I, I noticed you have an Apple Watch on, and I was curious, what's your relationship? I noticed you didn't. I don't have mine on, <laughs> but I should just, I should say I just got one. I got a surprise last night uh, for my, for my, my wife might be here with, with my boys uh, to congratulate us before we deserve congratulations for today. So I now am an Apple oh, okay, uh, watch, so put it on watch owner. Um, I, haven't I need to open it up from the box. Um, but I, I, I promise you I will. Um, but how do, you, do you continue to have a relationship with Apple today? Yeah, of course. And, yeah. and, 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 and sort of what, what's your take on sort of where things stand? Um, well, um, 
I'm a huge admirer of Tim Cook and his leadership, and he's he's a close personal friend to me and my family. But also, I think he's he's one of our moral leaders in America. I think he has enormous moral courage, and he has moved the company forward in ways that um, we should all be proud of. Um, he takes on very difficult issues, and he doesn't shirk the spotlight when he needs to stand up for what's right. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to know him uh, and be associated with the company through his leadership. Uh, also, some of the other executive team leaders are very close to me. I mean, I kind of grew up with them over the last 25 years, so. Um, the team has stayed pretty constant for the last couple decades, and they're still there. So it's really wonderful for me to be a, still very close with them. So my final question for you, and then we really will open it up, is this. Um, Steve has a remarkable legacy, which we all know, uh, and we are all fans. Um, when you look at your life um, and all of that you're trying to accomplish, I know there's a big question. What do you want your legacy to be in all of this? <laughs> Um, well, I hope, I hope I don't have to worry about that for a couple of decades. Um, but I, I, do, I do hope that uh, through, through my work and work of Emerson Collective and the amazing team members that I get to work with every day, I really hope we move forward in a very positive way some of the most difficult issues of our day. You know, at some point, we'll be passing the baton on to the next generation to try to tackle and wrangle some of these issues. But we're also living in a remarkable time of inflection in many different avenues. And, and I hope that in the end, we've improved people's lives, that we've lifted people up, that we've made things a little bit more equal, uh, and that we continued to show that that this experiment that is America is made better through the diversity and inclusion uh, of all people who want to be here. I love that answer. Thank you for that. Um, applaud, please. Yeah. Please. Um, let's get the lights on and uh, see if there's some questions for uh, Lorene. We have a question. I, I can see already a hand here in the front. Hi, my name is Dan Price. I have a company in Seattle called Gravity Payments. Um, it seems like a, a lot of people in this room, their goals, the, the outcome of their goals boil down to consolidating and growing wealth and power. And it seems like there, there's a very upbeat mood around that topic here. People are really happy and, and people are excited about where the economy is going. Mm -hmm. But the, the word you used, that which I agree with, was corrosive effect of inequality racing in the wrong direction, you know, it just seems wild to me. And I've had the privilege of meeting people who, who are in families where they, they're very wealthy and they have multi-generational wealth. And I've noticed that the corrosive and toxic effect on the relationships within those families is actually very striking as well. And so to me, I, I wonder if you, how you think about wealth and, and being somebody with so much responsibility um, and, and how, what wisdom you have to share for all of us about having a mission that in some way really just boils down to creating a culture that has more toxicity and potentially subjecting our families, kids, grandkids, great grandkids to more toxicity rather than a better platform and more freedom and, and more opportunity. Um, that's a beautiful question. Uh, I think that as human beings, sometimes we forget that we're going to die. And that's a bad thing. I think um, in many ways, death is one of life's great inventions because we're just stewards for the time that we're here. And when we have that mindset that we're stewards, that we're caretakers, that we should make decisions that affect seven generations, um, then it changes your priorities. We, we do have, I, I, I'm, a, I'm obviously a, a child of America, so I understand and appreciate capitalism. I think that we need, we need to amend capitalism. We don't need to 
change it entirely, but we need to make it more fair and just because we see that actually it doesn't uh, distribute the kind of gains in an equitable manner. Um, speaking personally, as long as I am not materialistic and, and, and motivated by money, which I'm not, then I won't pass on those values to my children. My, my ch that, and that's really important to me, that my children understand that, that we're here for a brief amount of time, that good work can outlast you, that really your body of work and the intention behind it is what matters. So thank you. Beautiful answer. <laughs> we have another question, ma'am. Hi there. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing with DACA. I'm an ex-Dream Act recipient myself, so uh, anything I can do to help the cause, by the way, happy to. Uh, my question for you is, because you're, you, you're working in so many diverse fields now, right, from education to media to technology, what do you think is the one industry or the one thing that people aren't paying attention to that we really should be? Um, some people are paying attention to sensible gun laws, but not enough. I think that we, we need to, as, as a country, pay attention to that and force our lawmakers to, to make decisions that, that truly make us all safer. I think that, um, that you're paying attention to it, and you might call your congressperson, but we need everybody to raise their voice in the next month and call their congresspeople and say we need common sense immigration reform and let's start with passing the DREAM Act and then let's build on it and, and protect the families of dreamers and let's remember that we're a country of immigrants and that's the lifeblood of our economy and our society um, and pay attention to that. I think also people aren't really paying attention to the fact that the best and most important investment that we can make as a society is in the education of our children. And, and so education is underfunded, even though we, we do spend $600 billion a year as, as a country on K-12 education, we actually aren't spending it in the right ways and we're not valuing it and we're not valuing the, the teaching profession the way that we need to. In South Korea, the, the word for teacher translated is nation builder. And that's how we should call our teachers nation builders. We should educate them as nation builders. We should develop them professionally as nation builders because that's literally what they're doing. They're building our next generation. And uh, I feel like we give it very, very shrugging attention. Hello. Thanks. Sir. Again, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, question, there's a huge unmet need for what I call mid-career education. Hypothetical I would give to you is someone joins GM at 18, works there for 25 years, gets laid off. They didn't do that contract. They played by all the rules and now see you later. That is morally wrong, but also promotes social unrest. Uh, quick, quick actual experience talking to someone in tech support a couple years ago. What's your story? I was a lumberjack. I got laid off for environmental reasons. I'm now in tech support. So this is doable. I want to see what your thoughts are and what you may be focusing your resources on there because it's a huge need for the country. I agree that it's a huge need for the country. It's not something that we're focused on particularly, although we are investors in Udacity, um, which, which is an online learning platform. Um, I think com companies like Qualcomm and AT&T, um, and I know that, that you had the CEO here today, are doing really interesting work on skilling up their workforce and, and having a proprietary um, uh, intranet in the, in the way that they, they outline all of the jobs that are available in the company. You see exactly where you are with your skill base. If you see a direct pathway to accelerate through acquiring different skills, they give you $8,500 a year to actually take online courses, to get retrained, and, and they'll monitor how you do and then reward you for taking it. I think any company that's not dynamically preparing the, its workforce is going to lose out. Um, and so it's, it's really incumbent on, on the companies to, to build out their workforce. 
Uh, there are some other online platforms, though, that I think are, are hugely exciting in the realm. I have to leave it there. Irene, thank you so very much. I don't know if I asked any good questions, but I promise you had very good answers. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you so pleasure. much. Thank you. No, pleasure. I really appreciate it. This was so much fun.